Let's pray one more time. Father in heaven, as we come to your word, give me humility of spirit, boldness, that I might decrease and Christ would increase, and give to your dear people here ears to hear, hearts to feel, minds to understand, feet to go, wills to obey. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This coming summer, June 4, 2024, will mark the 35-year anniversary of the Tiananmen Square Massacre. None of you students were born then. Your parents, if they're around my age, were only 10, 11, 12, 13 years old. I imagine that many of you know nothing or have perhaps not even heard of this event. If you have, it's almost certainly because of a single photograph. Chinese officials in Beijing issued a crackdown on pro-democracy students protesting their own government. Chinese officials record the number of deaths at 300. The Chinese Red Cross say it was closer to 3,000. Britain's ambassador said the death toll was more than 10,000. And if we remember this event at all, and as it comes around to this summer, perhaps you'll remember this moment here in January, and you will see somewhere on your social media feed, somewhere on the internet, you will see this photograph. Don't Google it now. Google it later. Tank Man. It's the picture of a young man holding two bags of groceries standing before a column of tanks. You can watch the video and you can see the man moving from side to side as the tanks try to skirt around him, not wanting the embarrassment in front of the whole world of running over a pro-democracy student with a column of tanks. Eventually, he climbs onto the tank. He yells something to the soldiers inside. And there, what has become, you can say without exaggeration, one of the most important photographs of the 20th century, the young man with bags of groceries there in front of a column of tanks. And to this day, no one is really certain who the man was. Some have identified him as a 19-year-old archaeology student, 19 years old, the age of many of you in this room. But that picture has become one of the most important photographs of the past 100 years, come to represent courageous defiance in the face of authoritarianism. Almost as famous, perhaps a photo that you've also seen, is a black and white photo taken from sometime in the 1930s showing hundreds of people giving the one-armed Nazi salute. I won't do it, but you know what it looks like. And then in this sea of humanity, there is one man very deliberately crossing his arms in defiance that he will not give to Adolf Hitler, his salute. That man is thought to be August Landmesser, who was sentenced to a labor camp when it was discovered that he was engaged to a woman named Irma Eckler. Irma Eckler was a Protestant by religion, but she was a Jew by nationality. Eckler, the woman, would die in a concentration camp. Landmesser, the man who there with defiant arms crossed was drafted into the penal military service, and he died in battle in October 17, 1944. Tank man. Folding arms man. If these men could stand up to regimes for political reasons, how much more should each of us who call on the name of Christ be willing to stand up for Jesus and the cause of the gospel? Our text for this morning comes from Daniel chapter 3. I invite you to 
turn on your devices or open up your Bible and turn to Daniel chapter 3. It is one of the most well-known stories in Daniel and well-known stories in the Bible. Perhaps you're very new to the Bible and we're really glad that you're here and you'll be hearing this story for the first time. Others here grew up with this and you can picture it and you've had Sunday school lessons about it. The man in the fiery furnace. And the point of this passage and of this sermon is very simple. And it is this. Do the right thing no matter the cost no matter where you are, and no matter who is watching. Or if you want to put a Bible verse on it, a single Bible verse, we can quote Peter's words in Acts 5, 29. When they had brought them, they set them, that is the apostles who were preaching in the name of Jesus, contrary to the word of the council, set them before the council, and the high priest questioned them, saying, we strictly charged you not to teach in this name, yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. If you want one verse that summarizes this passage and this message for your life here or around the world, it is this, we must obey God rather than men. I'll add a quick nuance. And that is to say that, of course, we aren't looking to be unwise, nor are we looking to go somewhere ill-prepared. We are not looking as Christians to be as offensive as possible, as if we should think that because people hate us, we must be doing something right. If everyone loves you, And if everyone hates you, you're probably not doing it right. Even in the early church, the churches during the times of intense Roman persecution forbade Christians from reporting themselves to the government. Now, this is a very strange thing for most of us in the West, but some were so eager, in fact, over eager for martyrdom that they rushed in and said, here we are, I'm ready to suffer. Well, it's good that you might suffer for the cause of Christ, but the church father Augustine argued that injury itself did not make one a martyr. It was not simply that they were hurt or that others hated them or that they suffered, but Augustine said, what made a martyr is that you pursued what was noble and true and right and Christ-honoring no matter the cost. So the point of this message is not to try to get yourself and those around you into much trouble as possible. So there's the quick nuance. But we must obey God rather than men. Looking then together at Daniel chapter 3. This is the third chapter in a row where we have the same basic pattern in Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar threatens to kill people if he doesn't get his way. And then God's people respond with skill and bravery, and then they are blessed for their faith and ability. Different circumstances, same story, chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3. We could label the three movements, problem, power, promotion. It's amazing how Lig had all of those P words. It just comes through the Presbyterian ordination process. You come with them to the text, but they're here. First then, let's look together at the problem. It's a long passage. I do want to read all of it, but we'll read it in sections. So verses 1 through 15 introduce us to the problem that these men are facing. Daniel chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, whose height was 60 cubits and its breadth 6 cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then King Nebuchadnezzar sent to gather the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up, 
And the herald pro proclaimed aloud, You are commanded, O peoples, nations, and language, that when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, as soon as all the peoples heard the sound of the hornpipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, all the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward, another name for Babylonians, and maliciously accused the Jews. They declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever! You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image, and whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? There's the problem. It's plain as day. King Nebuchadnezzar makes this massive image of gold. A cubit, as best as we can figure, is a, a foot and a half. So the height is 90 feet to the top of this room by nine feet. This is what often happened in the ancient world. Statues were erected and people were made to marvel and wonder or worship. We have them in Babylon and Persia and the Greek empires. The tallest in the ancient world was the Rhodes Colossus, since destroyed, but reputed as one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And it soared to 70 cubits. This is 60 cubits, so just a little taller than this one. 70 cubits is about the height of the Statue of Liberty from foot to crown. So this is a very tall statue at 60 cubits. Nebuchadnezzar sets it up in an open space in the plain of Dura, somewhere there likely in the south of Babylon. And did you notice how often I had to read through a list of all of those officials and all of those instruments? There are seven officials that are mentioned. There are six kinds of musical instruments. The list of officials is repeated in verses 2 and 3. The instruments in verses 5 and 7. The various peoples are repeated in 4 and 7. They're told to bow down and pay homage in verse 5, 6, and 7. So some scholars think this repetition indicates that this began as an oral history, just as you're telling a story verbally, you tend to repeat yourself. And one of the ways that the storyteller has to think about what comes next is to have certain set repetitions and rhythms. So perhaps this began as an oral story that was later written down, that would make sense. But one of the other reasons I think we have this official language of seven magistrates six musical instruments repeated several times as that this was a festive atmosphere. This was a kind of empire-wide holiday or celebration. You could not miss what was going on. You couldn't avoid it. It was all around you. You, you couldn't help but hear the musical instruments or any time you would come within eye shot of Dura, you would see this massive statue this is how you know what the dominant religion is in your culture. Who captures public time and public space? 
Well, Nebuchadnezzar had. Maybe it's something like the month of June in most parts of the Western world. Rainbow flags everywhere, even illuminating the White House and parliaments and places of power and privilege throughout the world. You can't avoid it. Pride is everywhere. There are parades, there are celebrations, there are great festivities, there are commercials, there are banners. It's all around you. What dominates the public time and the public space, that tells you something about the real religion of a people. And so here they were with this massive statue. If you don't worship, you will be cast into the fiery furnace. This was not uncommon in the ancient world. Jeremiah 29, 22 says, the Lord made you like Zedekiah and Ahab, whom the king of Babylon roasted in the fire. We found archeologists, these ovens throughout Persia for killing criminals. And then look, some Chaldeans, verse eight, come forward to get these men in trouble. And they say in verse 12, there are certain Jews. Now listen, this is relevant in our day, and sadly has been in almost every day. Hatred for the Jews is one of the oldest and most persistent evils in the world. And though we pray as Paul, that great apostle, Jewish apostle to the Gentiles did, that the Jews might know their Jewish Savior, yet we will not countenance the hatred of the Jews. And so here the Chaldeans come and they say, there are certain Jews. Oh, great, Nebuchadnezzar. Earlier in Daniel, we're given their Hebrew names, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, but they're better known to us as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And look at verse 12. Look at what they're charged with. These men, O king, notice three charges. They pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods, and they do not worship the image that you have set up. Now, we understand the last two, but don't miss the first one. They do not pay attention to you. Their life is not defined by you. Surely, we need more Christians involved in politics. Surely, politics matter. Surely, we are right to care about elections in whatever country you come from, and it matters who is the king or the prime minister or the president. And yet, just as surely, this is true in our day, that people's whole lives come to be centered around a single earthly man or woman. Don't miss, the first charge against these men is they have not made Nebuchadnezzar uppermost in their thoughts, in their minds, in their attention. They're not living every day wondering what Nebuchadnezzar is going to say, wondering every day what Nebuchadnezzar is going to do. They are not, in fact, paying attention to his commands, which makes Nebuchadnezzar furious. When you don't worship the idols of our age, those idols are angry. Nebuchadnezzar gives them one more chance. As is often the case, it's not that repressive governments are looking, not always looking to murder and kill, sometimes they are, but often they just want control. They just want to see that you'll do what they tell you to do. They don't want to go to all of the trouble and the bad publicity of having to run you over or having to throw you into a fiery furnace, but they will, they will if push comes to shove. And so Nebuchadnezzar, like a shrewd politician, is willing to give these men one more chance. It makes Nebuchadnezzar look full of mercy. And what better way to show his mercy but also the greatness of King Nebuchadnezzar if these three proud Jews will in front of everyone lay down their rebellion and simply kneel. 
I'll give you one more chance, he says. And here comes the music. It's going to play one more time. And here's what you're going to do. You're going to fall and worship, right? And if you don't, what God will deliver you from my hands? You see that in verse 15? What God will deliver you from my hands? Now think of all the pressure that was on them. From our cultural distance, it seems rather simple. Most of us are not in a culture where this, in such an overt fashion, would be the danger. A massive 90-foot statue and everyone has to bow down to it. Just like you look at those photos of the people giving the Nazi salute and each of us would like to think, well, surely I would be the one doing this. But would you? Would I? Think of all the pressure they were under. Everyone was doing it. The power of conformity. Yes, it's easy for us. We're not in that social system. Just like some of you, if you have younger brothers and sisters, and maybe you have siblings who are in middle school, and you who are at the end of high school or in college or grad school, you look at those siblings, what they're dealing with in middle school and the things that, oh, the fainting fits that they have. And you, very mature 18-year-old, can look and say, pish posh, you silly little middle schoolers. It's not important. Trust me. Trust me. You don't have to be with it. Just go to school wearing what's comfortable. It's all right if you you got a spot or a blemish or two. It'll clear up. But that's because you're not there. When you're not in the social system, the pressures of that system don't feel the same to you. But don't miss all of the pressure of conformity that would have been on them. Deuteronomy 4 says, the Lord will scatter you among the peoples and you will be left few in number among the nations where the Lord will drive you and there you will serve gods of wood and stone, the work of human hands that neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. The Lord, even in Moses' day, anticipated this is what will happen. You will rebel against me and eventually you will be cast out and you will be among people who do not worship the one and true and living God. And you will do what everyone else is doing. We don't have record of martyrs under the Babylonian regime. Now, is it possible that they simply, their stories are not told, or they, in quiet defiance, did not bow down? Well, that's possible. Or is it the case that most of God's people were too comfortable, and they were willing to do the very thing that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would not do? I remember from one of my professors in seminary, David Wells, this memorable definition of worldliness. Worldliness is whatever makes sin look normal and righteousness look strange. That's worldliness. And it doesn't come to you in a logical syllogism. It comes to you from the movies you watch, the things you laugh at, the clips that you pass around, and a thousand other signals that the world tells you to save yourself until marriage is ridiculous. Righteousness looks strange. Sin looks normal. And so it must have for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And not only that, but it's what they had seen their whole life. They had grown up around this. It seemed completely normal to them, and you add to that the layer of authority and intimidation, the fear of death, and the very real understanding that to refuse to bow to Nebuchadnezzar's statue would have signaled to everyone else not courageous defiance as we see them, but they would have thought, who are these fellows? And don't you know, they're not even really one of us. They're Jews. They're not Chaldeans. They don't belong here. How did they get to be so anti-nation, anti-king, anti-social, anti-a-good time? Where did these bigots come from? So you can understand the problem. And then we come to the power that God gives to his people. Verse 16. 
Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. The Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury. And the expression on his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated. And he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and the other garments, and they were thrown into the burning, fiery furnace because the king's order was urgent. And the furnace overheated. The flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to the king, true, O king. He answered and said, but I see four men unbound, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. The answer that the men give is amazing. We do not need to answer you, Nebuchadnezzar. You are not the boss of me. You can play the music all you want, and we won't do it. Yes, there are really difficult gray areas sometimes in life. Sometimes it takes a lot of ethical musing, and it takes a lot of wisdom to determine right and wrong. That's very true. There are, there are hard ethical questions. But sometimes, don't overcomplicate it. This was not a hard one. It was a hard one to obey. It was not a hard one to figure out. Do not bow. We are not so, we like to think of ourselves as rational. And you go to school and you learn and you develop these great powers of intellect and you like to think that we're just very rational people and we just weigh the evidence. But of course, that's not what we're like. From the very beginning, we are not so much rational as we are rationalizing. And almost certainly, there are some of you here, your conscience has been stricken because you know what you have been doing is not of the Lord. You may not even be a Christian yet. And you feel that. This is not right. What I've been doing at school is not right. What I've been doing with this man, with this woman, what I've been doing alone in my room, this is not right. I know it. I can feel it. That's the Lord's work in your conscience. Don't complicate it. Don't look for a rationalization. Sometimes it's as simple as folding your arms, saying, I refuse to salute. I refuse to bow takes two things. Confidence in God's ability. He can save us. And submission to God's will. Even if he doesn't save us from this fiery furnace, we will not worship your gods. Because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego knew that it would be of much greater and eternal danger should they disobey God than they disobey man. They know God's power. October 16, 1555, church celebrates the Oxford martyrs, the martyrdom of Hugh Latimer and Nicholas Ridley. As Bloody Mary tried to take England back to Roman Catholicism. Latimer was 68, Ridley around 55. Latimer says, as they're brought to the stake to be burned in these famous words, be of good comfort. Mr. Ridley, and play the man. Listen there, men, not all masculinity is toxic. Play the man. We shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England as I trust shall never be put out, and it has not been put out. 
Now, yes, you say Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had a happy ending. They were saved from the fiery furnace. But they do not know that, verse 18, but if not, God can save us in a thousand different ways. We don't know that he will. If not, we still will not obey your wicked command. Now, think of all of the self rationalizing justifications they could have given to themselves to simply bow. If I were there, I would have been thinking through these sorts of rationalizations. Maybe you would think, God will forgive us later. He understands we don't, we don't really have a choice. I mean, what's the choice? We, we, we die. Surely God doesn't want us to die. He'll, he'll forgive us. Or maybe they would have said to themselves, look, we're functionaries of the state. We've been given this position. It's our job. And we will, in our hearts, be personally opposed. We'll bow, but in our hearts, we know we're personally opposed. Maybe they would have thought to themselves, it's just a a physical action. What does it mean? What matters is the belief in my heart, and I know in my heart that Yahweh, in fact, maybe as I bow down... I'll do a little under my breath, Yahweh is Lord. Just very quiet. And Shadrach, my friends here, they'll hear us say it together. No one is asking to give up our God. Nobody said that they had to renounce the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They simply needed to bow. How could that be so wrong? Maybe they would have thought of all the practical considerations Well, we have families to care for. What good will it do? God has given us this important position in the government. And if I can just bend in this one area, I'll remain at Nebuchadnezzar's side. In fact, he'll trust me and I'll be able to carry out his plans. I've been given such a great position. He wouldn't want me to give up my influence now. If I die, some pagan administrator will take our place. No, 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 no. We would actually be serving God better in the long run if we simply bow, take a knee, live to see another day. Those are the sort of thoughts I would have had going through my head. But they didn't bow. They knew the commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. And they had in their hearts and their heads, I will obey the first commandment even if it kills me. Should the image of God bow before the image of of man. They were made in God's image, commanded to bow before an image of a man, and they refuse. And Nebuchadnezzar is furious, orders the furnace seven times hotter, so hot that the men who bring them there are killed by the flame. Even if they hadn't been saved, it would have been a miracle of faith that three men refused to bow at the pain of death. That would have been a miracle of faith in itself. They would have testified to the world that this fire, O Nebuchadnezzar, has no power over us. Isaiah 43, 2, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned and the flame shall not consume you. God proved true to his word. So from their problem to their power, and now very quickly, we see their promotion. Follow along the last paragraph, verse 26. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning fiery furnace. He declared, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire, and the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the king's counselors, gathered together and saw that the fire had not any power over the bodies of those men. The hair of their heads was not singed, their cloaks were not harmed, and no smell of fire had come upon them. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree... Any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb, and their houses laid in ruins, for there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. 
And the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. The point is not so much their promotion as it is their courage. Did you notice from verse 13 onward, their names, why are these names so famous? Why do you remember them, especially if you've grown up in the church, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Well, they're repeated 12 times over and over, that we might know who they are. Hebrews 11.34, by faith they quench the power of the flames. They are the living embodiment of Revelation 12.11. They conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they loved not their lives even unto death. I'm preaching through Revelation at my church. It's 22 chapters, so chapter 12 Verse 11 is just about the exact middle of that book. As many verses on one side as at the other. It's the literal and the thematic center of the book of Revelation. That they conquered him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, for they loved not their lives even unto death. The book of Revelation is one of the hardest books to understand in the Bible, and yet it's one of the simplest The book of Revelation is about something that all of you know. In fact, many of you have it right now on your feet. It's a little swoosh. The Greek word Nike means victory. Nikao, overcome, conquer. That's the Greek word in Revelation over and over. To him who conquers, to him who overcomes. Nike. How are we more than conquerors through him who loved us? By the power of God's Spirit, by the power of his word, enabling us that we love the word of God more than we love our own lives. So it was with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were busy serving the true God, verse 17. We won't have the courage to withstand the pressures of the world here or wherever the Lord sends us if God is simply an appendage to our lives, something to round out, something to give us some meaning on Sunday morning, just for an hour, not much longer, if He isn't everything in our lives, here's the question, is God bigger, is God better? He was bigger, He was better for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And so they would not bow. He is bigger, He is better than any country, any king, any president, any parliament. Walt Kaiser tells the story of Louis XIV who requested at his funeral in Notre Dame that all the lights would be put out except for one candle on his casket. And the court preacher got up to give the oration and violating the dead king's wishes, he walked over to the casket and he blew out the candle and he began his sermon with these words, only God is great. Only God is great. Do not give your lives for things that will not last. I love this country in which I was born, where I live and serve. I hope you love the country wherever you're from. But the United States of America, Canada, whatever country you come from, is not promised to last. The story of the world is not about America. It's about the church, Christ, and the devil in this conflict. So give your life for what matters. These things and these people are fading, are passing, are quickly here and gone. Did you know on November 29, 2023, a little more than a month ago, Henry Kissinger died. Henry Kissinger was born in Germany in 1923. He was Jewish. He fled Nazi Germany in 1938. He settled in New York, uh, New York City. He had a BA, an MA, and a PhD from Harvard. National Security Advisor under Nixon. Secretary of State under Nixon and Ford. Perhaps the most powerful Secretary of State in the history of the United States. He won the Nobel Peace Prize, a Guggenheim Fellowship, Woodrow Wilson Prize, Medal of Liberty, Presidential Medal of Freedom, He opened relations with China. He pioneered the policy of detente. He negotiated the Paris Peace Accords, which ended the U.S. involvement in Vietnam. He was one of the most influential diplomats of the 20th century, and he lived for a hundred years. Why do I mention Henry Kissinger at the end of this sermon? 
Because you've never heard of him. Somebody's saying, I have, I'm a history major. God bless you. (laughs) Most of you know nothing about one of the most consequential, important men in the 20th century. Quickly forgotten, even if you live a hundred years and have all of those accolades. Give your life for what matters. Dale Ralph Davis tells the story of a KGB official who was sent to check out a church on Sunday. He was impressed by the devotion of an older woman kissing the feet of Christ on the cross. Presbyterian parentheses, I don't condone statues of Christ on the cross in your church, okay, in parentheses. But the KJB official says, Babushka, are you also prepared to kiss the feet of the beloved general secretary of our great communist party? And this old saint replied to him, why of course, but only if you crucify him first. It's a good answer. Only if you crucify him first. Listen, Jesus is not asking you to go where he has not gone. He is not asking you to carry what he has not carried. He is not asking you to face what he did not face himself. In death, resurrection, ascension, and exaltation. God can do all things. He can preserve his servants. He can reveal dreams. He can send angels. He can promote his people. He can rebuke kings, tear down kingdoms, set up, and bring low. He may save you from the fiery furnace, or he may not, but here is his promise. If three of you are thrown into the fiery furnace, there will always arrive a fourth man. Christ does not always remove us from our troubles, but he always meets us there. Crucify him first, and I will follow him to the ends of the earth. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we give thanks for your word, and we pray now that you would so move among these thousands of young men and women that we might put Christ first and last and always. And we would obey you no matter the cost, no matter where we are, no matter who is watching. And you, O oh Lord, will be so much more than enough. In Jesus we pray. Amen.